Good afternoon and thank you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics and leads IWP's Center for Intermarium Studies. At IWP, he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He is the author of Intramarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hodakiewicz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's business as usual at IWP, and we'll continue with our story of the Second World, I mean, the First World War and its aftermath in the Intermarium. Last time we chatted, uh, we concentrated on historical and non-historical nationalism, nationalisms. Today, we'll talk a little bit about the intellectual context, namely, we must understand that at that time, there were two main gains as far as nationalism in town. Uh, both presented themselves as champions of national sovereignty, of uh, self-determination of nations. Um, one was the so-called proletarian version of um, self-determination of nations, and that was a mendacious one. And the second one was liberal internationalist version of um, self-determination of nations. And that proposition was in the earnest, not necessarily most solidly thought through, but it was earnest, not uh, diabolical, not Machiavellian, like the so-called proletarian. Um, self-determination of nations. Um, let me begin with a few quotes. All-time favorite Joseph Stalin uh, defined nation uh, as follows. A nation is a historically constructed stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. Uh, pretty neutral. Uh, the next quote is from a young scholar, Sarah Cameron. According to her, World War I was a critical moment in the spread and development of nationalism as empires broke apart and activists wielded the language of national rights. During the Civil War, the Bolsheviks had utilized the language of nationality to distinguish themselves from the whites and win over non-Russian groups. Vladimir Lenin argued that nationality, uh, 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 argued that the Bolsheviks would right the wrongs of their colonial predecessor, the Russian Empire, placing non-Russian minorities on equal footing with the Russians. Moreover, ideologically, Lenin and others believed that nationalism was a necessary stage, a phase that all groups had to pass through on their way to becoming socialist. If Kazakhs and other non-Russian groups were to become socialist, then it followed that Moscow had to assist these groups in first reaching and then passing through this historical stage. And next, I have a quote from Herr Anders Rudling, the Bolsheviks believed it possible to construct a national consciousness of a socialist kind 
national in form, but socialist in content. They further believed that national identities were constructed a byproduct of modern capitalism. So much for the novel, novelty of the th uh, thesis of Hobsbawm, Gellner, and Anderson of, of uh, um, mentality being constructed. It all comes from Bolshevism, uh, from the revolution, and predates by about 80 years anything that is now current in Western academia, on the left, of course, well. Ethnicity became a key component in segregating the people into loyal and disloyal subjects of the new nation state, is a quote from a neo-Marxist historian, Thomas Balkelis. Let the four quotes from Stalin to Balkelis, all by people on the left, well, various rabidity of their uh, radicalism, let the four quotes, lengthy quotes, serve as our background for, for this inquiry. In theory and practice, the concept of self-determination of nations cannot be understated because it introduced the egalitarian rule to international affairs. In political science, Parlance, truly the idea of self-determination of nations dictates that all national entities, all states are equal state agents. According to this idea, all national entities as national states, nation states, or aspiring nation states are equal. Thus, the concept of self-determination of states armed and made equal new non-historic folk nationalisms, making them identical in claims and rights with historical nations such as, say, Hungary and Poland. For Warsaw, initially, the idea of self-determination of nations he meant uh, the realization of Polish dreams to restore the old Commonwealth. That's how it appeared at the outset in 1914. However, the situation began to evolve and soon it became clear that legal and moral equalizing of the Aguilonian nationalism with folk nationalisms of those people, non-historic people aspiring to statehood in the intermarium spelled a disaster, a uh, defeat for the concept of the restoration of the old commonwealth and it entailed the necessity to redefine the vision of uh, reborn Poland, as well as the uh, as it forced fighting, armed fighting for Poland's borders, not only with external enemies, the great powers, but also with internal enemies folk nationalisms. The concept of self-determination of nations introduced chaos and discord, which following World War I, they became a handy excuse to interfere in the business affairs, internal affairs of the so-called successor states, both by Eastern and uh, Western powers. Moscow and Berlin pretended that they cared about minority rights. And this was, this interference naturally um, was uh, carried out 
to the beat of the drum of self-determination of nations. Sheer hypocrisy on the part of Germany and Soviet Russia. In this sense, Poland apparently gained at first from the idea of self-determination of nation, nations and later in reality lost. A conservative witness of these developments, taking the example of ethno-nationalist Lithuania, described this situation as far as internal affairs of the old Commonwealth as follows. The idea of self-determination of nations despite snide smiles, which it sometimes has generated, is undoubtedly a beautiful and sympathetic idea. We must not deny the right to self-determination, not only to two million people, because that is how many people were in Lithuania, or that is how many people the ethnic Lithuanian tribe counts, uh, but we shouldn't deny the right of self-determination, even the tiniest nationality, to a ti to, even to the tiniest nationality. But there is a difference between self-determination on the one hand and a unbridled and overgrown ambition of a small nation to impose its will and language on millions of people of other nationality. This is in particular the case when the small nation borders on uh, two rapacious giants, Germany and Russia, and its neighbor next door used to be its uh, ally for 500 years. Namely, I'm referring to Poland, whose strength and independence were and will be the only guarantee, not only for sovereignty, but straight out biological existence of the Lithuanian tribe. For this, the Lithuanians hate the Poles because basing themselves on Poland threatens them with Polonization. In this paradox, if this is a paradox of all, is the heart of the Polish-Lithuanian quarrel. This quarrel tragically thwarted by the developments of a few last, uh, a few previous years. The author is referring to um, uh, the Second World War. This quarrel has nearly always been bloodless, something like a quarrel in the family. As far as um, the good side of the Polish issue, in this quarrel we have always been the calm, composed, and even generous side. We have never felt towards the Lithuanians the sort of hatred that they, or rather their upper strata, because the uh, Lithuanian people do not display animosity to the Poles. Well, we do not feel this sort of hatred that they feel towards us. In this complicated ideological and historical context, 
two versions of the postulate regarding self-determination of nations emerged. First of all, there was the proletarian option. Its author was the Bolshevik leader, Vladimir Lenin. Second of all, there was the liberal option and its greatest champion was the American president, Woodrow Wilson. The first option, in short, we can call Leninist, a Leninist Machiavellian option. The second one would be Wilsonian idealism. The liberal version is a sovereign nation state with a uh, democratic parliamentarian system. The proletarian version meant that sure, nations deserved self-determination, in particular, if that destroyed the old order, but this was totally secondary to the concept of international solidarity of the proletariat, whose aim was to establish a world communist state. In this take, the right to independence belonged only to proletarian forces with a codicil, namely there would be inevitable joining uniting sooner or later into a world Soviet Republic. Why were these two versions the most important, two options most important? Because their authors were victors. Wilson won World War I and Lenin, the Bolshevik coup d'etat and civil war in Russia. These two options were sanctified with success backed by force. And force or its uh, specter were required to implement those options in life. Lenin articulated his theories about self-determination of nations before Wilson. As in many other instances, uh, the socialists, including Bolsheviks, had everything worked out theoretically, at least according to their dogmas. The cruel fate of history caused that in the intermarium, the, these theoretical constructs of the Bolsheviks were implemented in life And their leading experts, uh, and the, and their leading expert and exponent after Lenin was Stalin. Wilson and his internationalist liberals were not as well prepared. They um, deluded themselves that they can hear in the socialist propositions echoes of their liberalism. However, the world views behind this allegedly common commitment to self-determination of nations could not be more dissimilar. Wilson approached matters from the relatively benign perspective of American liberal internationalism, an approach to international relations based on progressive history and social science rooted in the American experience, which emphasized cooperation. In contrast, the Bolsheviks saw the world in black and white colors through Marxist eyes, espousing the ruthless suppression of the ruling classes by the proletariat at home and abroad as a prelude to permanent revolution. This is a quote from Borislav Cherniev, Twilight of Empires. In practice, the formula, the formula of proletarian self-determination dialectically expressed itself more or less as follows. The proletariat of each country deserves self-determination, but not the bourgeoisie. 
Each nation, therefore, should rejoice when the power is taken by the native proletariat. At the same time, at the same time, proletariat fulfills its historical mission in the ideal of class solidarity. In this sense, the proletariat of each country, which naturally has the right to self-determination, uh, and even when it uh, has managed to achieve it through bringing the proletariat to power, at the same time aims to unite on the basis of the rule of class solidarity with the proletariats of all other countries. Here, the ideal will, will be the world Soviet Republic, and before such can come into existence, uh, there should be, there can be the joining of all neighboring proletariats into the Soviet Union. According to Richard Pipes, whenever the interest of nationality and the proletariat conflicted, the former had to yield to the latter and the right to separation had to go overboard. That meant that the right to self-determination was a relative because everything had to uh, give way to the primacy of the proletarian revolution, i.e. communist power. After all, in optimal, under optimal conditions, the Leninist law to self-determination was to fulfill itself in the framework of a centralized state. Federalism or exterritorial cultural national autonomy were viewed as counter-revolutionary and reactionary because they weakened a centralism of the state. The only permitted option was to separate from Russia and to create an independent state. Of course, such an independent state was also relative because it had to be proletarian. That means Soviet. According to Pipes, the uh, according to Pipes, a right of national self-determination interpreted in this manner seemed to lend it to fulfill all the requirements of a good socialist solution of the national problem, it made a direct appeal to the nationalist sentiments among Russian minorities for the purpose of winning their support against the autocracy. It was democratic and as such conducive to the ultimate victory of socialism. It was in harmony with the tendency of capitalism to form national states and it speeded up the assimilation of the minorities. This is Richard Pipes in the formation of the Soviet Union. To summarize, under certain conditions, Lenin allowed for national bourgeoisie to execute the law, or the right to self-determination of their nation, but not when it conflicted with the proletarian revolution. In May 1917, Lenin 
explained. The policy of national oppression inherited from the autocracy and monarchy is maintained by the landowners, capitalists, and pe petty bourgeois to protect their class privileges and to cause this unity among the workers of the various nationalities. Modern imperialism, which increases the tendency to subjugate weaker nations, is a new factor intensifying national oppression. The elimination of national oppression, if at all achievable in cap capitalist society, is possible only under a consistent democratic republican system and state administration that guarantee complete equality for all nations and languages. The right of all the nations forming part of Russia freely to secede and form independent states must be recognized. To deny them uh, this right or, or to fail to take measures guaranteeing its practical realization is equivalent to supporting a policy of seizure or annexation. Only the recognition of the proletariat of the right of nations to secede can ensure complete solidarity among the workers of the various nations and help to bring the nations closer together on truly democratic lines. The conflict which has arisen at the present time between Finland and the Russian provisional government strikingly demonstrates uh, that denial of the right to free secession leads to a direct continuation of the policy of Tsarism. The right of nations freely to secede must not be confused with the advisability of secession by a given nation at a given moment. The party of the proletariat must decide the latter question quite independently in each particular case, having regard to the interests of social development as a whole, and the interest of the class struggle of uh, the proletariat for socialism. The party demands broad regional autonomy, the abolition of supervision from above, the abolition of a compulsory official language, and the fixing of the boundaries of the self-governing and autonomous regions in accordance with the economic and social conditions, the national composition of the population, and so forth, as assessed by the local population itself. The party of the proletariat emphatically rejects what is known as national cultural autonomy under which education, etc., is removed from the control of the state and put in the control of some kind of national diets. National cultural autonomy artificially divides the workers living in one locality and even working in the same industrial enterprise according to their various national cultures. In other words, it strengthens the ties between the workers and the bourgeoisie culture of their nations, whereas the aim of the social democrats is to develop the international culture of the world proletariat. The party demands that a fundamental law be embodied in the constitution, annulling all privileges enjoyed by any one nation and all infringements of the rights of national minorities. The interests of the working class demand that the workers of all nationalities in Russia should have common proletarian organizations, political trade union, cooperative educational institutions, and so forth. Only the merging of the workers of the various nationalities into such common organizations will make it possible for the, for the proletariat to wage a successful struggle against international capital and bourgeois nationalism. Well, as is plainly seen, despite relativistic or dialectical rhetoric, Lenin left no doubt. Proletarian self-determination of nations meant centralization and enslavement of nations by the communists. The fruit of this enslavement was precisely the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, the liberal theory about self-determination of nations was not relativist, but absolutist, at least in theory. Naturally, practice and life forced adjusting both the liberal and proletarian options of self-determination of nations to the challenges of dynamically changing times. But both options maintained and protected their 
basic characteristics. The Bolshevik option was very much more elastic because as uh, brilliantly, as, as Richard Pipes put it brilliantly, it was based upon a double standard. The result was the so-called proletarian colonialism, which Pipes coined, and even uh, first attempts to establish so-called people's republics and even people's democracies. According to Viktor uh, Sukhenitsky, the difference between Lenin and Stalin was also tiny or more precisely tactical. Uh, Lenin believed that one should take advantage of national bourgeoisie to struggle against imperialism and colonialism. And during those struggles, uh, they can be permitted national self-determination. Naturally, at the same time, the communists were supposed to assist the proletariat, the national proletariat, uh, which should constantly struggle against the bourgeoisie. The class struggle must not be suspended even during struggle for independence, but its intensity ought to reflect the conditions. Sometimes it ought to be acute class struggle and sometimes it must be toned down. When national bourgeoisie won against the imperialist and uh, colonialists, class struggle must be intensified. If national bourgeoisie was losing, class struggle had to be moderated. It had to be calmed down. However, Stalin claimed that only the proletariat deserves self-determination, so there should not be talk at all about independence of states led by the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie must be immediately liquidated and their states. Therefore, from the very beginning, the so-called proletarian self-determination must be promoted. And at the same time, the proletarians of other nations must be encouraged to unite into a world republic of Soviets. And before that comes to existence, they should unite with uh, Soviet Russia. At any rate, both Bolshevik leaders constantly in their propaganda stressed the slogan of self-determination of nations and this propaganda reached everyone. Very few took the trouble to read between the lines, to read indeed at all the complex theoretical constructs of the communists which appeared under such seemingly and exciting slogans. In addition, Lenin and Comrade and his comrades had it much easier because the Russian whites refused to recognize independence of any czarist subjects. Instead, they were fighting for one and sovereign Russia. Only General Wrangel would break with this nonsense in the fall of 1920, recognizing Polish borders, 
deep in the borderlands far to the east. But unfortunately, this was too late for the white cause. Meanwhile, as Richard Pipes stresses, the Bolsheviks promised everything to everyone, including sovereignty and self-determination of nations. Until the armed takeover of power by the communists in the revolution in Russia, Lenin and his comrades pushed an extreme interpretation of national sovereignty, of self-determination of nations. There were no more determined champions of independence of nations who were part of the Russian Empire than the Reds. No more determined champions than the Reds for national self-determination, in particular in the Russian Empire. Naturally, what they wanted was a maximum, uh, a maximum amount of chaos to destroy all state authority. Once they captured power, at this very moment, the Bolsheviks began a gradual retreat from their initial absolutism as far as self-determination of nations, and they would emphasize their relativism on the question. Their leader faced a dilemma how to reconcile the slogan of national determination with the necessity to maintain the unity of the Soviet state. As a result, the territories which were under Lenin's control failed to be bestowed with the grace of self-determination by the communists. However, in the territories where the Bolsheviks were not in power, they supported the option of proletarian self-determination to the hilt. The territories threatened by local anti-communists or Russian whites would become a subject of compromise. The Reds co-opted local nationalists, in particular leftist nationalists, say in Central Asia, in Caucasus, or in the Ukraine, to destroy the forces of reaction, colonialism, or intervention together with them. After the victory, nationalist postulates would then be co-opted by Lenin, national in form, socialist in the content, as Stalin put it. So he would co-opt some of the nationalists, and he would shoot others or expel them. At this stage, the communists temporarily promote, promoted a hybrid known as national Bolshevism to channel nationalism and to le legitimize their power over the conquered um, neighboring nations. This was just a dialectical maneuver, which following a, a provisional attempt to accommodate was abandoned. And then Moscow would turn to homogene, uh, homogenization and centralization, as well as Russification. It is characteristic that it was Joseph Stalin who already in December 1917 called for the sharpening of the course 
toward self-determination of nations. And this was in the context of the crisis in the Ukraine. According to um, Stalin, according to um, according uh, to Stalin, the Soviet original government may allow may not allow national self-determination to serve as camouflage for the counter-revolution. The, he was the he was the com, commissar of uh, minorities of nationalities. Uh, he wrote at that time, it is important to limit the principle of free self determination of nations by bestowing this right onto the working people and denying it to the bourgeoisie. The principle of self-determination should be a means to fight for socialism. In this context, proletarian self-determination uh, was simply a class struggle uh, and the establishment of, uh, of uh, workers' dictatorship with the aid of the Soviets and the Bolshevik party, wrote Stalin. During the eighth uh, Congress of the Bolshevik party in March, 1919, Nikolai Bukharin endeavored to reconcile the Stalinist interpretation with the Leninist one. He argued that in industrial countries, the principle of self-determination should concern only the proletariat. However, in backward and colonial countries, it should concern also the bourgeoisie. Lenin objected. He crushed the opposition. He said, according to me, this kind of a communist is a great Russian chauvinist, and he lives in many of us, and he must be combated. He must be fought against. This, is, this was the only way to lull the persecuted, oppressed nations by Russia into inaction. Uh, the final resolution, the final resolution of the Congress reflected dialectical relativism of Lenin. To overcome the suspicions of the working, uh, the suspicions of the working uh, masses of oppressed countries, it is necessary to destroy all privileges and each privilege separately, which was enjoyed by whatever national group. And we must introduce the full equality of nations as well as, uh, as, well as recognize that colonies and nations which possess full rights also have a right to political secession. Uh, Richard Pipes commented the new formula very neatly solved the problem that the communists encountered. It gave them a free hand to agitate for national independence and to draw to themselves the sympathies of nationalists in such terrains where the communists endeavored to capture power without actually hampering the efforts to overcome the nationalist opposition 
on the territories which were already controlled by the communists. For example, in this manner, in the intermarium, the Bolsheviks were able to manipulate Jewish leftist nationalists, radical Zionists, and others to acquire their support. Nota bene in an extremely exceptional situation, such dialectics allowed the communists to ally themselves with the so-called blackest reaction against the enemies of Lenin and his comrades. For instance, in Azerbaijan, the Muslim religious and pro-Ottoman parties entered into a coalition with the communists against the Azeri nationalists, progressive nationalists, and liberals. At one point, Islamic reactionaries even considered a possibility to unite with the Azeri Communist Party. Liberal internationalism never had to go through such dialectical stages of uh, mendacity and deception. Despite a variety of problems, the liberal version option of the doctrine of um, national self-determination had a tendency to fulfill what it promised. In practice, a very good example to differentiate between the two options of uh, self-determination, the liberal and proletarian, is an open letter of the Bund, Jewish Marxist um, Socialist Party, written to um, Joseph Piłsudski in the fall of 1918. Uh, Piłsudski had just become a uh, uh, the head of the Polish state, Naczelnik Państwa. He immediately invited all Jewish parties to cooperate in the first government of independent Poland. Practically all Jewish political options met with the commander already on November 12, 1918. Only the Bundists refused. They declared, we inform you that as a uh, socialist party, we take the position of opposing in principle any bourgeois government. There is no reason to believe that the government which we are about to form could correspond to our demands in principle so that our attitude should change. This was a, an unequivocal declaration of enmity by the Bundes, by this particular option of Jewish socialism, toward the first free Polish government in 123 years. Normal Jews wanted to operate with the Poles in the context of the liberal nationalist paradigm, but the Jewish Marxists of the Bund, absolutely not. The matter became even more complicated as far as other socialists, not only Jewish leftists mentioned that I've just mentioned, but to all, uh, active in the Polish land. This concerned on the one hand, those who regarded, regarded themselves as the representatives of the Polish 
nation, and on the other hand, those their ethnocultural background notwithstanding, who consider that national feelings or patriotic self-identification was useless luggage, baggage that should be discarded and even a uh, malicious prejudice or malicious reactionary prejudice which thwarted the achievement of the revolutionary paradise on earth of perfect equality and justice. In, this, in the second case, I mean the proletarian internationalists who ostentatiously killed in themselves totally, or at least to a very large degree, uh, any national feelings. This way they became a type of a new man, supranationalist, cosmopolitan, usually Soviet. Think Felix Dzerzhinsky. They were not interested in the liberal option of national sovereignty. Although in some cases, they were willing to give uh, the proletarian self-determination a try. Such types functions functioned naturally not only in Poland, but everywhere in the world. Their Polish opponents on the center right and right rejected the native um, adherents of socialism and other related ideologies for a variety of reasons. Some opposed violence, others collectivism, still others rootlessness or abandonment of uh, uh, real feelings towards one's family, milieu, region, and nation in favor of, an, uh, of abstract incantations about humanity. All patriotic Polish activists unequivocally rejected socialist internationalism. They preferred patriotic reality over utopian abstractions. Generally, they referred to all leftist adherents of the revolutions as socials, sociały. As one of the Polish magnates, Mieczysław Jałowiecki, Prince Pierre Jesławski, uh, wrote in April 1970, uh, 1917, I did not understand at that time the difference between a socialist and a Bolshevik. For me, this was the same scum and churlishness. Notabene, this is precisely how Jewish conservative, in particular, religious conservative, related to all sorts of leftists. Jewish conservatives, in particular religious conservatives, became one of the most prominent targets of the, of the revolutionaries as reactionaries and bourgeoisie. In particular, Jewish radicals spared no bile to besmirch them. And whenever they could, Jewish conservatives responded in kind. For instance, in July 1918, in a very similar way as Jałowiecki, the Jewish conservative Moses Pfeiffer, uh, representing religious orthodox, publicly accused a Jewish folkist or leftist populist 
Nachem Priutsky, Nayak Prilotsky, of Bolshevism, and he suggested that this particular leftist should move to Soviet Russia where he can exercise his extremist social political experiments to his heart's desire. Further, Pfeffer pointed out that his adversary harbored a very negative attitude towards Poland and the Poles. And he stressed that it was precisely the Jewish leftists who were aggravating the, uh, the Polish or the Jewish-Polish conflict. These are precisely the same arguments that the Polish patriotic side deployed customarily against uh, broadly understood uh, Jewish leftists and reactionaries. But that is another story. Thank you very much.